The story begins on the birthday of Princess Daya, the only daughter of the Emperor of the Frieze Empire, who is finally 17 years old. Now the heroine was standing at the window and thoughtfully watching what was going on outside, when suddenly a maid came in and asked her if it was time to go to the ball, to which she replied that she really should go. But first she wanted to say hello to her father. The girl, turning away, said that her father must not be coming to the ball, as last year. And the maid, noticing that the mistress was upset, offered to go with her, but she thanked her and politely declined. We learn that Princess Dea's father is Emperor Cyril. People feared him and called him the Ice Emperor because he had ice magic and was famous for freezing anyone he didn't like. Cyril also treated his daughter coldly, and his gaze was icy, and sometimes he even tried to kill her. But before the ball started, Princess Daya still went to see her father. On the way to the emperor, the heroine thought that he didn't love her at all and had arranged this ball just for show. Realizing that she would soon be married off and this was the last opportunity to see her father this year, the heroine wished that he would wish her a happy birthday, even if insincerely. Abruptly freezing, the protagonist turned around, at first not realizing what had happened, but she was immediately pierced by icy needles that pierced through her. Clutching at the wound and raising her eyes full of despair, she saw before her the Ice Emperor, who hated her so much that he wanted to kill her. As he approached his dead daughter, the man looked at her disappointedly and held her tightly against him, sadly expressing his wish for everything to be iced over. Thus, Princess Daya was killed by Emperor Cyril's vicious ice blades, and he went mad and froze everything around him. Thus came the end of one of the worlds. Slamming the book shut, the girl exhaled disappointedly, calling the story hopeless, and admitted that she bought the book because of the beautiful cover and was glad she didn't finish it. Staring at the ceiling, the heroine thought about her life. She came home from work tired, so she read a strange book and did not understand what she was doing. We learn that she's been working in a black office for three years now, and today is her 31st day on the job with no days off, so she's exhausted to death, wants to escape reality, and at one point reads, pulling herself away from the sad thoughts and remembering the plot of the book again. The girl wondered why the emperor cried at the end and destroyed the world. She didn't think one cried after killing, but assumed that maybe he only realized how much he cherished his daughter after the loss. The heroine still couldn't make sense of the story and thought she had read something wrong, but she put the book aside anyway, deciding that it didn't matter, and she didn't care what the truth of the story was because she had to go to work tomorrow. Thinking about the fact that the plot of the book was still quite realistic, though strange, and in life and not such things happen, the girl fell asleep and had a dream in which she became Princess Daya and woke up not in her house. When she opened her eyes, she realized that it was only a dream, but when she heard the offer to drink milk, she was dumbfounded, thinking that there was a baby somewhere near, but she tried to answer the maid, but could only mumble something incoherent. Hearing her own strange squealing, the heroine hurriedly crawled to the mirror but immediately turned pale when she realized that she had become a small child, who was immediately taken in her arms and offered to drink milk from bottles. The protagonist tried to resist, but felt her body wanting a drink for the little ones, so she decided not to hold back. At the same time, she tried to convince herself that she was just overworked and dreaming strange things. After drinking milk, the girl wanted to sleep, and the maid, noticing this, smiled affectionately and wished her to grow up big and healthy, calling her Princess Daya. Hearing her new name, the sleepy little girl froze, realizing that she had heard this name somewhere. Pale with surprise, she found herself in the arms of the maid as she suddenly heard the approaching footsteps of some cold and commanding man. Suddenly, the door opened, and before the heroine, who was now being held by her babysitter, stood Princess Daya's father, the emperor of the Frieze Empire, who was a tyrant an ice emperor who turned anyone who resisted. She recognized him immediately because she had seen him on the cover of the book. Staring directly at the imperious man who entered, the little princess, analyzing everything she saw, realized that she was now Princess Daya and squealed with horror. That was how the story of the ice emperor and her began. Not taking her eyes off the emperor who looked at her with his cold gaze, 
The heroine felt as if her heart was about to freeze. She was scared. Suddenly, a man walked up to her and the maid and put his arm around her. And the girl realized that Emperor Cyril, Princess Dea's own father, was now looking at her as if he wanted to kill her. The maid, frozen with horror, asked him what he was going to do, and he, obviously not expecting to receive such a question from the servant, barked that she did not dare to cross him, but her kindness was stronger, and she asked the emperor to calm his anger. The man froze, and the maid, bending before him and clasping the child to her, began to beg in tears to spare the princess, for she was his dear and only daughter. The protagonist, having guessed that the maid Katie was now risking her life for her, tried to protect her and tell the aggressor not to dare to meddle with innocent people, and not to think that if he is handsome, he can do anything. But as expected, she could only mumble. The little girl was indignant that her father was so handsome, and his character was trashy, and he was ruining his whole life. And the latter, seeing that she wanted to say something to him, declared that the time was up and almost killed her, when suddenly the other maids entered the room. The maids, who had come to inform Mrs. Katy that they had finished the laundry, froze when they saw this picture. Their master had surrounded the poor girl with the child in her arms with icy needles, and, noticing the entrance, nonchalantly headed for the exit, ordering them to tidy up the room. The maids, left in the room with only the co-worker and the baby, immediately rushed over to them, anxiously asking how Katie was feeling and picking up the crying baby who thought she was finished. When she came to her senses, the girl realized that her father was so hateful, but in the end, he didn't kill her, and she remembered that strange feeling after the ending, in which he, having killed her, cried and pressed her against him. Waking up some time later, the heroine was again greeted by her babysitter Katie, and now she realized that she never returned to the real world, which means it was not a dream. It's been three days since she became Princess Daya, and she, Nakano Anna, may have died from recycling 31 days in a row, and it looks like she'll now have to start a new life as Princess Daya, and if it's like in the book, Emperor Cyril will kill her when she turns 17. The protagonist's musings were interrupted by the maid's announcement that it was time for the child to eat. As they surrounded her, they noticed that she smiled much more often and called her adorable. Sipping milk from a bottle, the little girl heard that one of her nannies was even worried about whether the girl would be stolen by some monster, and the girl, taking everything at face value, tried to remember whether there were monsters in the book. When the princess noticed that she was frightened, the maid hastened to reassure her, explaining that their castle was protected by a barrier, so no monster could get in. She was relieved to hear this, but immediately frowned again, remembering that there were worse monsters here. After a while, the infant was carried outside and told that this was the empire of the Frisians, the country ruled by Emperor Cyril, and the latter, gazing admiringly at the scenery, remarked that the world was indeed beautiful, but that after her death, it too would come to an end. Guessing that she had a memory of the story, even though she didn't memorize everything from fatigue, the heroine wondered if she could prevent that tragic ending. At night, lying in the room with the window open wide, the girl stirred, noticing that she was very cold, and opening her eyes, saw before her the emperor, who again looked at her with an icy gaze. Frozen with surprise, the protagonist began to wonder why he had come to her, when suddenly, he reached out his hand to her. The poor little girl's whole short life flashed before her eyes, and she realized with horror that, since after her death he would destroy the world, it turns out that their universe would die so quickly because of her. Feeling the hopelessness of the situation, the heroine decided to go to extreme measures and grabbing her father's finger, made a facial expression that was not capable of leaving indifferent to any person. When she noticed that the man shuddered, she was glad that her strategy had worked and pointed out that her father was scary and Princess Daya must have cried at the sight of him. But now Princess Daya was a girl who had worked in a black office for 31 days in a row, so she wasn't scared of anything. The girl, who had decided to melt his heart with her sweetness, began to jump on the crib, and the latter, grinning, called her helpless and said that she could do nothing, which greatly angered the infant. Then the little girl, who suddenly found herself in the hands of her frightful father, turned pale with horror. She thought that he was going to kill her, 
and her plan would not work, but he only lifted her up, looked at her daughter with warmth, and kissed her on the forehead. The heroine froze, dumbfounded. She hadn't expected this from the man who had tried to kill her just a couple days ago, and tried to figure out which of the two images of the emperor she had seen was the real one. Time passed, and now the heroine was four years old. Now a grown-up little girl, she sat reading the book, asking her babysitter Katie for help with the reading and thanking her for her help. In the book she had read about Amalantias, the good god of this world, whose magic could be used by humans due to the blessing of that god's spirits. Suddenly her thoughts were interrupted by a newly turned maid, who noticed that the princess was reading a complicated book, and marveled when she learned that she was reading it out of pure interest, calling her very clever. The girl, surprised at Katie's reaction, looked at her questioningly, and she explained that such books are mastered only at ten, and added that the main character began to speak quickly but learned to read very early. The heroine was embarrassed by the praise, but still realized that reading books is important because she must gain a lot of knowledge to avoid a bad end for herself and the world. The excited maid turned to the girl again and suggested that she should take a break from reading and take a walk in the garden. When she heard this, she smiled dreamily and agreed to have a little fun. The maid and the little girl were walking down the corridor, discussing the blooming of the queue, when suddenly, raising their heads, they saw the emperor, the captain of the Knights of the Empire, and the chief wizard of the Empire. Finding herself right in front of them, Katie bowed to them in greeting. Looking at her father, the heroine noted that he was looking at her still coldly, but resolutely declared that she would not lose to him, and immediately thinking of a plan, smiled happily and thanked the emperor for his work. But this pleased everyone except her main goal. So one of those who came up even noticed that the girl would now go to the garden, and she promised to bring him beautiful flowers. The emperor froze in place, indifferently gazing at his daughter, and the chief wizard of the empire distracted him by reminding him that they should go about their business. The latter, keeping his eyes on the child, declared that he wanted to freeze everything, and his companion hastened to calm him down and asked him not to speak like that. After turning around and heading to her destination, the princess's father asked her not to go beyond the barrier, whereupon the heroine, left alone with her babysitter, thought it was creepy and wouldn't understand his mood swings. Up until now, the protagonist has been behaving as befitting Emperor Cyril's favorite daughter, greeting him, thanking him for his work in the hope that his daughter's smile will make him kinder, and her plan has even partially worked, so that rumors have begun to circulate that he is behaving more gently with her. However, despite the fact that the plan was thought out perfectly and even partially worked, the father still sometimes became harsh, and the heroine realized that she was hardly saved from a bad end. But if events change, she must be careful. When she went outside, the girl sat down over the lawn and began to look at the queen plant, which had not yet bloomed, and then, Noticing one black flower in the middle of a field of white ones, she asked Katie if a black plant could grow, to which she replied that there was no such thing. The heroine, looking puzzled at the nurse, pointed to the black flower, and the latter, looking where she was pointed, was stunned and shouted to the child to immediately move away from the plant. But she had already begun to be sucked by the black stream. Finding herself in an unknown place, like a dark cave, the little girl did not understand what happened, but noticed that this place was not like the surroundings of the castle, as suddenly a wolf with three eyes appeared in front of her, which grinned and began to growl, which frightened the little girl. The heroine immediately decided that it was necessary to run away, but in attempting to do so, she accidentally fell and began to call for help, and the wolf at the same moment was in front of her and roared deafeningly. Suddenly, the girl, who had already prepared to die, opened her eyes, feeling that the monster was no longer there, and saw that it had been thrown away by a huge piece of ice, which was the work of her father. Clenching his teeth, the emperor froze the evil beast and broke the ice in which it was imprisoned so that it was immediately disarmed. The dazed heroine raised her head and guessed that her father, who was now looking at her with his former cold gaze, had saved her from certain death from the fangs of the huge monster. The girl, guiltily lowering her head, thanked her savior and explained that she saw a black cue in the garden, and then suddenly found herself in a strange place, 
after which a wolf appeared, and she was frightened. But the emperor, hearing this, called her stupid and said that black cues do not exist, and it was actually a monster pretending to be a flower. The heroine only now realized that it was her fault for walking up to that flower. She turned around sharply, noticing the pack of wolves behind her interlocutor, and the latter tensed up, irritated that they should have run away from here as soon as he arrived. The father froze all the enemies in the same instant, and his daughter looked at him admiringly and noticed that he had power worthy of an ice emperor, a master of ice magic, and remembered that he could freeze the entire world. There was silence, and the emperor, looking again at his daughter, explained that the monster had thus lured her and dragged her into his lair through the distorted space. But the girl, interrupting the speaker, remembered that there was a barrier in the castle and inquired how the monster had gotten in. The man put his hand to his forehead and sighed irritably upon hearing the ridiculous question, and the protagonist resented why he sighed and couldn't just explain it to her. After all, she was only four years old and assumed it meant that monsters could still get through the barrier. Suddenly, her father, never ultimately answering her question, reached out his hand so that the little girl felt a cold that was stronger than before and stated that the weak die, weak warriors, the unknowing, the powerless fall victim to others. The girl gulped nervously, realizing that he hadn't come here to save her, and the emperor, gathering all his power in his fist, had said he was going to get rid of her tainted blood. The heroine, who guessed that things were going very badly, immediately found herself nailed to the ground by the ice flows that her father had let loose at her. And the man approached her and tried to figure out if she had lost consciousness or was still blind. When she woke up in her room, the little girl looked around dazedly and noticed the servants surrounding her, who, noticing her bewilderment, explained that His Majesty had returned with her and she had slept all day since then. Remembering all the events of yesterday, the protagonist did not understand how she managed to survive and asked to call her babysitter Katie, but the maid said that she could not come to her yet, and the girl immediately flew up on the bed, thinking that she was caught by monsters. The terrified maid refuted her assumption and told her that their colleague had been accused of failing to protect the child from danger and had been imprisoned in a dungeon. After Katie said that it wasn't Katie's fault, she guessed that her dad had ordered her to do it and asked him to call her and let her talk to him. She immediately explained to the stunned maid that when she saw the black flower, her colleague had asked her to move away from it, and it was her own fault for not moving away. The new babysitter crouched down in front of the little girl and looked hopefully into her eyes and declared that she was the precious sole heiress of this country, and it was their duty to protect her from everything. And since someone had failed to do so by being there for her, it was no wonder they were being punished. Their girl looked pitifully at that girl and letting go of her hand, repeated that she still did not agree and asked her to at least tell her father that she wanted to talk to him and the girl, hesitating, promised to give him her words. However, even after sundown, she still hadn't met the ice emperor because she had been told that he had saved the girl today. So he had gotten sidetracked and was now busy. The heroine, who heard that her father appeared to want to save her, pursed her lips indignantly and wondered why he tortured other people like that. She eventually decided that he was doing it because he thought she would suffer more that way and called him a goddamn sadist. The nurse, noticing the princess's violent reaction, asked her to bear it and added that not only Katie, but also the knights guarding the garden and the wizards in charge of the barrier were imprisoned but rumor has it that they would be released in a month and then apologize for not being able to help. The little girl realized that it wasn't anyone's fault that they were behind bars because they simply couldn't oppose the emperor and asked to be left alone. Lying on the bed and barely holding back tears, the heroine thought that it was good, at least that Katie was not executed, but she was still indignant at her father's insolence and got out of bed herself and decided to go to him and talk to him in person. On Tzu Wei, remembering that in the corridor in front of the emperor's door should stand knight's guards, who are unlikely to take her to daddy, if she asked, the girl decided to crawl to the destination through the ventilation. But it turned out to be very dirty, so she immediately discarded the idea. As she approached the open window, 
The protagonist thought that she would make a ladder for herself if she had magic, and remembering the actions her father had done, she guessed that magic could be used with the help of spirits, so she asked them to give her power. But it seemed to her that she had failed. Suddenly, the girl turned around and saw a ladder appearing in front of her and could not believe that she had actually succeeded, but still decided to take a chance and stood on the ladder, which immediately fell under her, and the little girl flew down, screaming that she did not know that the steps would disappear so quickly. Thinking that she was about to die, the heroine meekly covered her eyes, but found herself caught by someone's magic, and then was lowered to the ground, where she was finally able to open her eyes fearfully. The boy, who had fallen to his knees in front of her from helplessness, asked how she was feeling. But she, noticing that he was obviously worse off than she was, asked him how he was feeling, and he guiltily explained that it was the first time he had lifted something heavier than a cat, so now he felt weak. The savior, whom the girl, smiling radiantly, thanked, admired her, thinking her very beautiful, and suggested that this must be what the spirit of light looks like. Paying particular attention to her hair, the young mage remembered that only his majesty and the heiress had silver hair in this castle, and immediately guessed that before him stood the princess, who now, hearing the approaching footsteps, hurriedly shut up the new acquaintance who was about to call her by name. Noticing that she kept his mouth closed, the protagonist embarrassedly pulled back and asked her interlocutor what his name was, and he promptly introduced himself. His name was Faye Scrout, and he was five years old, and his grandfather was the chief wizard of the empire, Lyburn Scrout. We learn from the heroine's musings that Scrout's family are aristocratic officials, experts in magic. It is now clear to her why he has magic at such a young age, and she has asked what he is doing here. The boy, rising from the ground, replied that he was on his way to train in magic, as magic power was increased on a moonlit night, and answering the girl's question, said that he was angry at him for walking at night, so he got out secretly. The protagonist, after listening to the story of the interlocutor, guessed that he could become invisible, and he turned pale with fright and asked how she knew it. Now, the little girl realized that this was the reason why she didn't see anyone when she looked down. Smiling, but not answering the little mage's question, the girl asked if he could make her invisible as well, to which he replied that it was indeed possible if they held hands. Taking the boy's hand, she immediately met his surprised gaze and earnestly asked him to help her meet her father. But at the same moment, a peer came up behind the dazed child, who promptly knocked him to the ground and put a blade to his neck. The attacker, who was now looming over Daya's new acquaintance, looked sternly at the victim and asked why the princess was with him, and in the same instant she turned fearfully to her peer and declared that Fay was the grandson of the chief wizard, so the aggressor should put away his sword. The young mage, who at first glance might seem like a shy kid, was not ready to give up so easily, so he rudely asked the boy who he was and why he was walking in the middle of the night and he proudly introduced himself as Ivan Rogue, the son of the captain of the third squad of Imperial Knights, Oliver Rogue. Fay, who was finally able to get to his feet, muttered that it didn't mean he was a knight either, and turning to Lady Dea, said that the fact that he was walking around the castle at this hour seemed suspicious to him. Realizing that he had been stumped, the captain's son hurried to justify himself and explained that he had just brought his father's things to the dormitory and stayed there overnight. But he couldn't sleep, so he went out for a walk, and the listener, without listening to him to the end, replied that one shouldn't go out at night anyway. The heroine, deciding that it was worth intervening in the conversation, explained to the second new acquaintance that Faye just wanted to practice magic secretly. Hearing this, the blonde-haired boy asked him if he lived in the mage's dormitory to which he received an affirmative answer. The young knight, after hearing the confirmation of his guess, turned to the princess and seriously stated that he was lying to them because from the dormitory to the place of training go on a completely different road, and then, closely approaching the pale peer, asked him whether he really lied and whether he was definitely from the Scrut family. With his head bowed guiltily, the little boy apologized to Lady Daya and told her that he was actually worried about his grandfather, who was now in the dungeon, and wanted to check on him. 
The protagonist, hearing the confession of the interlocutor, remembered that the main wizard was also imprisoned and hurriedly apologized to her new friend for the fact that it happened only because she was kidnapped. And he, realizing that he put the girl in an awkward position, exclaimed that she was not guilty of anything. The second boy, who had been silently eavesdropping on the conversation all this time, decided to intervene and said that the young mage was right and the barrier was in fact a hole. The dark-haired one took it as an insult, so the boys almost argued, but were interrupted by the little girl. The girl, after waiting for silence, turned to Faye, saying that if he was so worried about the head wizard, it would be easier to just convince her daddy of his innocence and ask to be released from prison and offering to go to him together. The heroine, at first not meeting with a positive reaction from her acquaintances, announced that she was going to him to ask him to free all the prisoners, and only then did Faye, holding out his hand to her, earnestly ask the lady to take him with her. They shook hands to seal the agreement, and the girl asked him to make them invisible, as suddenly the captain's son intervened in the conversation, who, putting his hand to his breast, asked to take him too, much to the surprise of the others. As they walked down the corridor holding hands, the children tried to see if they could be seen or heard, and finally concluded that if they spoke quietly, they would not be heard, and the angry boy snorted and hoped that his companion had not mishandled the magic and they had indeed become invisible. Hearing that the latter did not trust him, the boy grabbed the aggressor by the arm and exclaimed that if he was afraid he could just leave, and the latter, trying to defend his honor, replied that he was more afraid of being left alone with the princess, and the latter immediately shushed them to be quiet. After calming down, the children began to speculate as to where His Majesty might be, and the girl immediately guessed that he was always working, so most likely sitting in his study. However, if he was not found that way, they should go to his bedroom. The boys asked their companion if she knew where his office was, and the latter, after trying to reproduce in her memory the location of the cherished room, replied that she did, and asked them to trust her. Finally, when they reached the door of the study, they stopped, and now the girl was glad she hadn't come here alone, because it was quite creepy. The boy, who was also tense about the atmosphere here, hoped that the monsters wouldn't penetrate the barrier this night and explained that it was so quiet now because the wizards were inactive. When she heard that it was possible to pass through the barrier, the interested little girl asked her friend to tell her more about it, and he squeezed her hand tighter and said that only knights and wizards knew about it, but some high-level monsters could pass through the barrier unnoticed. Guiltily lowering his head, the boy added that it was very difficult to create a barrier protecting from absolutely all monsters, and wizards were tirelessly improving it every day. But monsters were coming up with new ways to get through it, so it was an endless race. The heroine, staring pensively at the floor, now guessed where the flower had come from in the garden, and her companion, still holding her hand, hastened to reassure her by saying that the barrier not only made the monsters weaker, but also immediately notified her of their appearance so that they were quickly disposed of. According to him, the last incident that happened to the princess is quite unusual because the monster wasn't eliminated immediately, and even his grandfather didn't notice the monster's infiltration, which was very strange. Ivan, who had now decided to intervene in the children's conversation, remembered that the knights had said that a man might have been behind it, and the girl, hearing this, realized that her abduction was no accident. Then, trying to get to the emperor's study, the children hid from the guards, sometimes got lost, but still managed to get to the cherished room. Once in front of the large wooden door, the protagonist realized she was overexcited, and Faye, noticing her confusion, asked how they would get in, but never got an answer from her companion. Suddenly, a voice came from behind the door to tell them that the door was open and asked the kids to come in which scared them madly and made them jump on the spot with surprise. The flustered princess decided there was no turning back and took the first step into the room, apologizing to her father for disturbing her, and he immediately asked her what she was doing here so late, and then noticed her companions, who were silenced when she tried to introduce herself. It turned out that the emperor knew these children, so, deciding not to stall for time, sternly asked his daughter what she wanted to talk about 
so much so that she distracted him from his work. The heroine, terrified of what was happening, still gathered all her courage in a fist and said that her nanny Katie and other people are in the dungeon after her kidnapping and she wants them to be released because they are not guilty of anything. The formidable father tore his quill off the paper and looked irritably at his daughter and barked that these mediocrities had failed to protect the heiress from danger. So they were entirely to blame for this and would not be released from the dungeon. The head of the empire looked fiercely at the children who had come and asked the little girl if they had induced her to come to him with such a ridiculous and absurd question. And she, trying to explain herself, replied that she had met them by chance and they had helped her. The angry father grinned and said that walking around at night with the heiress was unforgivable, so he was going to put them in the dungeon as well. When he heard his daughter's plea not to do so, he indifferently said that she did not yet understand what it meant to be an heiress and asked her to remember well what careless behavior could lead to. According to him, for such a crime, the whole family would be put in jail and it was necessary to get rid of the guards who guarded her room. The heroine interrupted him, shrieking that if she had done wrong, he should punish her. But the man, not reacting to the child's violent reaction, informed her that it was more effective to punish everyone than her alone. The girl, realizing that her words had no effect on her relative, shook, and barely holding back her tears said that if he hated her so much he should only torture her, and in general it would be better if he killed her right in the forest. Her father raised his eyes questioningly at her, but she did not hurry to calm down and accused her father of not protecting her at all, but attacking and scaring her. Clenching her hands into fists and deciding not to hold back her anger any longer, the girl clenched her eyes and shouted with courage that she hated her father, startling him and causing him to freeze in surprise. Disappointedly propping his head with his hand and closing his eyes, the emperor sighed disappointedly and said that it would be better if everything froze. He was shocked, and the girl, hearing his words, also fell into a stupor. The heroine's companion, who had been standing behind her with the other companion, whispered to the princess that she had better apologize, but she irritably blurted out that she had put up with it for a long time, but she couldn't take it anymore, because her father was angry and shifted his anger to everyone around her. The children who continued to stand behind the girl were already very cold, but she was in no hurry to retreat and repeated again to her father that if he wanted to kill her, then let him focus on her. Suddenly the ice that had previously covered the room disappeared, and the emperor spoke leisurely, informing her that he knew that those around him feared that he might kill his daughter. But he couldn't believe that she felt that way either. The little girl stared at him perplexed and confirmed his assumption, explaining that he had attacked her. Besides, she remembered the tragic end of the story, and her father, who drew her from her thoughts, asked tiredly, if she thought he wanted to kill her, why she was still alive. His daughter cringed upon hearing the question, for if she really knew the answer to it, she wouldn't have worried. The silence lingered, so she, sensing it, assumed that her father was keeping her alive because he liked to bully her. The emperor, disappointed at the explanation given him, answered nothing, and then turned to Oliver Rogue and Misha Scrout, standing outside the door, and ordered them to enter. The children of the named men glanced over and froze with surprise. Ivan Rogue's father, upon entering the room, immediately bowed to the head of the empire, asking on behalf of both of them to forgive their sons for their rudeness. And the young mage's mother, who had entered with him, supported him and added that they were ready to take responsibility for not stopping them. If only he would spare them. The girl, who guessed that they had been watching them all this time, asked in surprise why they hadn't stopped them, and the boy's mother replied that they had decided to respect her will. The emperor looked at his daughter, who was trying her best to hold back her tears, sighed, said that those in the room were disturbing his work, and ordered them to leave his office. Once in the hallway, Ivan's father slapped him on the head, angrily asking him if he really thought he wouldn't notice anything, and sternly stating that they would talk some more in the dormitory. The woman also turned to her son and informed him that they were going to have a serious conversation, noticing that her friends were now being told off by their parents. The princess turned their attention to herself 
and admitted that she was the one who had asked them to come with her, apologizing for it. She just couldn't bear it if someone was thrown in the dungeon again because of her. The boy's mother, named Faye, knelt down in front of the little girl, who stood with her head ponied guiltily, and explained that His Majesty did not know how to express her feelings, but was very dear to her. When she heard this, the girl shook her head in bewilderment. She knew that he had attacked her far more often than he had shown affection. Noticing that the child did not believe her, the girl smiled caringly and said that if he did not value her, he would have frozen her as soon as she entered the office. Deciding not to wait for an answer, the friend's mother took the lady's hand and informed her that it was quite late. So she decided to escort her to her room, which surprised even the guards who did not expect to see her with the emperor's daughter. Lying in her bed, the heroine could not sleep in any way. So she turned on the lamp, took a book, and read about the first prince of the kingdom of Frieze, named Cyril Frieze. We learn that when Prince Cyril was 10 years old, assassins from the neighboring kingdom of Alburn murdered the royal couple of Frieza, and he thereupon took command of an army, attacked the kingdom of Alburn, and won a brilliant victory, thus annexing the defeated kingdom to Frieza and founding an empire. Five years later, the kingdom of Mutra, a neighbor of the former kingdom of Alburn, declared war on the empire of Frieze, but the knights and wizards under the command of Emperor Cyril repulsed the attack, and Mutra also became part of the empire. The girl, finishing the story about her father, learned that many people resented such a policy of the young emperor, but he froze all the dissatisfied and everyone had long known that Cyril was a cruel and inhuman emperor. After reading the closing sentence, the heroine remembered the words of her friend's father and mother, who claimed that he treasured her very much. And afterward, a memory of a past life flashed before her eyes, when she thought why the emperor cried at the end and destroyed the world. Then she thought it was strange that one cries after killing. Putting the book aside, the little girl got out of bed and walked over to the mirror, thinking that if Princess Daya wasn't killed by the emperor, and he actually loved her so much that he wanted to destroy the world when he lost her. According to that theory, it made sense why he didn't kill her, but she still didn't understand why he was attacking her then, and who killed the princess in the original story. The next morning, the girl was awakened by her nurse Katie, who, thinking that everything that had happened before was just a dream, rushed into her maid's arms, not believing that it was really her, and asking if she had been released from the dungeon. The embarrassed maid smiled sincerely and revealed that this morning, His Majesty had released everyone who was responsible for the Black Flower incident, including her. Hearing this, the girl, wide-eyed with surprise, did not believe that her father really fulfilled her request, but decided to thank him later for such a kind deed. Glancing joyfully at Katie, the heroine said that it was very good that they were now back together. But the expression on the maid's face immediately became anxious, and she fell to her knees in front of the lady and began to apologize to her. The main character didn't even understand what she was talking about at first, but when she finally figured it out, she waved her hands in embarrassment and said that if she was apologizing for the incident with the flower, she shouldn't worry so much, because it wasn't her fault. After calming the maid down, the princess herself apologized to her for putting her in the dungeon. The maid looked up at the child with rapturous eyes and said that she was very kind. And looking at her, she remembered her mother, Mrs. Lila, which surprised her, and then asked her to relieve her of her duty to take care of her. Hearing the babysitter's request, the heroine guessed that she didn't want to take care of her because she was afraid that she would be punished again. But the girl admitted that it's not that, and in fact, she just thinks that she won't be able to protect her with dignity but she swore to Mrs. Lila that she would protect her daughter at any cost. The girl, tears of pity rolling down her eyes, noticed that the girl standing before her was very kind. And we learn that Katie came from a family of merchants and used to be a common worker in the castle, but was soon noticed by Princess Dea's mother and made her a servant. Katie then hit it off with a nobleman and with Lila's help married him, bridging the gap in her ancestry, after which she left the castle but a year later her husband passed away and she became a servant again. She was only able to go because of the support of Lady Lila, whom she truly loved and respected. But after a time, 
both Lila passed away after giving birth, and Katie ended up replacing Princess Daya as her mother, and surrounding the baby girl with love. The girl pressed her lips together in embarrassment, and realized that her life after rebirth had been so peaceful, thanks to Katie, who had held her so gently in her arms, which had given her the strength and courage not to fear the Emperor in the end. Grabbing the girl who replaced her mother, the protagonist asked her not to leave because she wanted to be with her further, but, realizing that she was not behaving very nicely, she added that if she was having a hard time with her, then she could leave, because the girl wanted the maid to smile. The maid cried and confessed that she didn't really want to leave her either, but if it happened again, she wouldn't be able to protect her this time, and the little girl, ashamed that she had disobeyed her nurse last time, promised to behave more carefully and become stronger so as not to make her sad again. Asking the girl again if she would stay with her, when she heard that she too wanted to become stronger to protect her, she held out her arms to hug her and suggested that they both try their best to be together forever. Hugging each other tightly, they cried, and Katie asked the princess to let her serve her until her last breath, which pleased the girl, who now felt a deep love and respect for her eldest. A little later, Katie escorted the heroine to the emperor, and standing outside the door, listened to their conversation. Coming into the study to her irritated father, the girl thanked him for freeing her nanny and the others, and the latter, with a saddened look at her, asked if she now understood why he did not kill her. In fact, the heroine had already guessed that the emperor valued her, but she did not dare to say it out loud, so she could not give a clear answer to his question and said that she was still thinking, and her father, again putting on a mask of indifference, asked the little girl to leave as she was disturbing him. The father had already turned his back and started to do his work, when suddenly his daughter turned to him again, asking for permission to learn magic. But her father did not allow her, because it was too early for her, and besides, she was not a wizard, and she had other things to do. Finishing by saying that she should at least internalize that she was a princess, the emperor went back to his business, and the girl, lips pressed together resentfully, realized that she knew he wouldn't let her do such a thing. Determined not to give up, the heroine again drew her father's attention, this time saying that she wanted to make friends, because she thought that with friends, she could learn a lot of new information and listen to all sorts of stories. The emperor was surprised, but closing his eyes tiredly and slamming the book shut, he allowed Daya to make friends and even promised to prepare a room for her to play and make friends. And she raised her hands joyfully and thanked him profusely, though she didn't like the way he put it. Sitting in the playroom and playing with the girl's toys, the princess thought that of course she was glad he had listened to her, but things were going completely differently than she had imagined. But then she realized that it couldn't be otherwise, because a four-year-old girl's games were just that. The father, who had been watching the children all this time, noticed at the end of the game that his daughter did not like to play with them, and she, not wanting to offend her father, tried to explain gently that she wanted to play with Fairy and Ivan. Hearing the little girl's wish, the emperor immediately threw a cold glance at her and asked if she really liked them. He wouldn't let her play with them because she was the heiress, but he didn't even explain the reason on his own. The heroine guessed that in the original story that would have been the end of it, but now her fate was in her hands. So she crawled up to her father, looked at him pitifully, and once again clarified whether she was not allowed to play with her acquaintances, and he again irritably repeated that he forbade her. It was not easy to communicate with him. Having guessed what his daughter was up to, the Ice Emperor called her insolent and warned her that he might throw her out for being too persistent, which angered the little girl who decided to make one more attempt and, coming closer to his interlocutor, began to beg him to let her spend a little time with the boys. The emperor, who was tired of such entreaties, exhaled tiredly and finally allowed her to play with her acquaintances, but only a little, which pleased his daughter. Sometime later, Katie, who had heard the princess's story, aghast, and said that she had never thought that the strict emperor would allow her to be friends with boys, and the girl added that, moreover, Tomorrow she could meet them, which is very happy. Keeping her eyes on the dreamy little girl, the maid remembered that she had been surprised to learn that she had been released from the dungeon at the girl's request, 
and remarked that perhaps His Majesty was different because of her. And so the long-awaited day came, and the Emperor brought the boys into the playroom as the girl had requested. Now all the children felt very awkward because the eldest sat down in front of them for the purpose of watching them play. Looking at the worried children, the Ice Emperor sternly stated that his daughter wanted to play with the children who had come and ordered them not to sit down but to start playing. But the girl was indignant, thinking how could anyone play in such an environment at all, and guessed that it was her father's fault for everything. The embarrassed heroine, trying to keep herself in control, looked guiltily at her father and suggested that he should get on with his work. But he replied that he was interested in how the children would play and asked to be shown. But the little girl thought again how they could begin to play when a man with such a displeased face was sitting beside them. The protagonist, noticing the embarrassment of her friends as well, quietly explained to her father that they could not calm down in his presence, and the latter assumed that they were going to play something he was not allowed to see. The girl immediately refuted his assumption, thinking that the sight of him simply frightened Ivan and Fay. Suddenly, a servant who entered the room bowed to the emperor, apologized for the disturbance, and said that he had come about a problem on the border of the Mutra region. The princess realized that this was her chance and supported the servant, telling the head of the empire that he should go, as he had plenty to do. The emperor, who simply could not refuse to do important things, gave his daughter a stern look, but did not argue, and rising to his feet, ordered the maid Katie to look after the children one last time. Left alone, the children exhaled with relief, and the girl, who also immediately relaxed, apologized for scaring them, and already sitting at the table with the boys, explained that her father did not seem to be in the best mood today. The maid poured tea, and the boys began to discuss that they had never thought that the princess would invite them to play. And she smiled sweetly, and said that it was easy for her to talk to them, and she wished they had taught her everything. Ivan, who looked at his interlocutor with astonishment, remarked that she was apparently too smart for her age and did not get along with her peers, and added that he had a younger brother and a younger sister, but they were still children. Faye, who was now sipping tea and listening to the conversation, reprimanded his friend for daring to compare Lady Daya to her relatives, and called him a rude man and the latter lost his temper at the same instant. But the girl, immediately regaining her temper, calmed her friends. Ivan thought about it and asked what they would talk about today, and the heroine exclaimed that she wanted to know about wizards and knights, so the topic of conversation was chosen. The young magician, glancing smartly at the interlocutors, said that he could tell about the wizards, but, looking at Ivan, said that he was not a member of the knightly order, which really hurt him and made him stand up, proudly clasping his hand to his chest, and say that all the men of the rogue family had served in the knightly order for generations and became knights of high rank. Finally, after he had calmed down and returned to his seat, the boy grinned and turned to his friend, asking if he could tell him about magic. He had challenged him, and he dared not refuse. Faye started his story with the fact that wizards are mainly engaged in solving problems with monsters, and first of all, protect the castle, but sometimes they have to exterminate monsters in different parts of the empire, and they also manage the barrier, create magical artifacts and so on. Ivan, who decided not to yield to his interlocutor, hastened to tell about the knights, who, according to him, solve problems related to people, catching criminals, smashing robbers. The heroine looked at the speaker with interest and asked if the knights had magic and the speaker said that he had heard that the captain of the knights did, but most still did not, including his father. But his sword was enchanted with a special spell, so he could fight mages. Finishing by saying that some people say that wizards are stronger than knights, but he doesn't think so. The boy proudly put his hand to his chest and declared that he would become a knight in the future and prove that knights are much more useful than mages. The indignant Fay said that he could hardly succeed, for however he might, wizards were stronger than knights. They began to argue, one of them saying that the other was an upstart, and the character of the mages was really bad, and the other, in his turn, asked him not to shout like that in front of Lady Daya, and exclaimed that he hated knights. 
Their argument made the little girl laugh, who asked them not to quarrel. The heroine really enjoyed chatting with Fairy and Ivan, so she asked her dad to play with them again, and as a result, she was allowed to see them once a week. And on the fifth time, she was even allowed to walk around the castle accompanied by guards. On one of the walks around the castle, the children decided to go to the garden, and the main character was very worried, as her last outing was not the most successful, but she remembered that today they have two guards with them, so this time they should not come across a strange flower. Ivan stretched out his hand admiringly to feel the wind and said that the weather was fine and it would probably be nice to sleep here. And Faye, looking irritably at the child, asked Lady Daya not to call the lazy man to walk anymore, which angered him very much. The heroine, smiling nonchalantly, informed her that she really enjoyed watching her friends talk so she wanted both of them, not one of them, but the guys didn't say anything back to her and turned away from each other resentfully. Suddenly one of the guards stopped and drew his sword, and the girl looked up to see a ghastly monster which released its vines and tried to grab the comers, but only caught the guards who were now disarmed. The mage who appeared in front of them turned to Princess Daya, standing next to the other children, and asked the lady to give him her delicious blood, much to the child's shock, causing her to freeze in horror. Finally, the other guards drew their swords and rushed at the stranger, but he grinned and stretched out his arms, using dark magic to transport the girl and her friends to another space. Now the little girl noticed the black flower. Ivan, coming to his senses, immediately rushed to the princess and asked if she was okay, and then they realized that they were in an unfamiliar place, probably in an old temple, where they seemed to have been moved by that evil wizard. Fay rose to his feet later than the rest, noting that the formula was rough and he was seasick, and the second boy, sternly cutting his friend short, asked him to gather himself, for the stranger would soon be here, but turning and at the same instant drawing his sword, exclaimed that that fiend had already come. Glancing slyly at the girl, the terrifying mage rejoiced that he had at last found the daughter of the Ice Emperor. Turning to the protagonist, the wizard again asked her to give him her blood, her magic. The little girl, frozen with horror, did not answer. But Ivan, who immediately appeared in front of her and covered his friend with himself, exclaimed that he would not allow the villain to do so. Trying to cut the vine that appeared in front of him, the brave boy flew to the side because he was unable to resist. And Fay, who also decided to help his friend, tried to break the dark thorns with his magic. The boy's magic proved too weak and he was unable to cut the vine, which immediately flew at him and also threw the kid back against the wall. Looking around at her friends lying on the ground, the heroine was numbed by the realization that they would all be killed at this rate. The girl shook with terror and asked the mage why he needed her, and he immediately replied that the flesh and blood of a young maiden imbued with powerful magical power was the best delicacy for him. After a closer look, the princess realized that the wizard standing in front of her looked like a human but didn't seem to be one and guessed that only her father could defeat such a monster. So she called out loudly to him and a blue flame immediately appeared in front of her. The emperor, who blinded his daughter with his appearance for a few moments, declared that he had already fulfilled her request several times but would not permit her to leave the castle. With a rapturous glance at her displeased father, the little girl exclaimed, and the knights and wizards serving the emperor immediately appeared behind the magician, the chief of whom at once raised their sons. Casting a glance at the stranger who had kidnapped the children, the ice emperor recognized by his cloak that he was among Lagzarin's rebels, and the stranger, laughing insidiously, once again resorted to the use of black magic. The knights and wizards, frightened by what was happening, fidgeted, and the emperor ordered everyone to stand back immediately and asked Lyburn, the chief magician, not to interfere. Deciding to deal with the child kidnapper himself, the Ice Emperor created a protective barrier for people. But the wizard said that it was all useless because he would absorb all the magical power of the barrier and then deprive him of his strength, dry him up, eat him, and finally eat his daughter. His. The Emperor, grinning, questioned if the aggressor was really going to eat him as well, said that he was out of his mind but getting angry, said that he would give him his magic power if that was what he wanted. 
Gathering all his strength, the Ice Emperor immobilized the wizard and ironically asked what he was waiting for, for his desired victim was ready to be caught. Having done nothing, the stranger turned pale, and the guards behind him began to cheer and praise the Ice Emperor, who had saved them all from certain death. Without reacting to the enthusiastic cheers, the man earnestly ordered the knights to take the stranger away to beat the truth out of him later, and those, bowing respectfully, began to carry out his order. The heroine, who had been watching her father all this time, now looked fearfully at him, and he, also paying attention to her, asked what was wrong with her face, but without answering, his daughter rushed to embrace the formidable man and cried, screaming that she was scared. Her emotions were overwhelming her. The father was angry at first, but softened, crouched down in front of the child, pressed her affectionately against him, and asked her not to cry so that she wouldn't make any noise. And the girl realized that she didn't even know it could be so warm in his arms. Finally moving away from his daughter, the Ice Emperor approached her friends, turning to address them as he was suddenly stopped by the heroine, who, barely holding back tears, reported that her friends were trying their best to protect her. The stern father, keeping his eyes on the children, replied that it did not matter how much effort they had made, for he had miraculously been able to feel the rise of magical power when his daughter had called him. But if it had not been for this miracle, they would all have died, for the weak die and protect no one. Hearing this, the boys sank their heads guiltily and clenching their teeth, agreed with the speaker. Some time later in the little girl's room, the maid Katie rejoiced that all had ended well, and on learning that it was the emperor who had saved the daughter of the mistress, to whom she was immensely grateful, bowed respectfully and thanked the girl's savior. Turning to her father, the heroine said that the monster man who had kidnapped her and her friends said she had tasty blood, and she had heard that monsters could get into the castle because they had attacked her before. The father lowered his head gloomily, and his daughter, not noticing this, went on and asked if he had attacked her so suddenly to protect her from the monsters that were closing in on her. Her father turned away and did not answer, confirming her guess. The protagonist, who had now guessed everything, asked the man why he had not told her about it before, to which she received the answer that she would have been constantly afraid of the invisible threat and tired if she had known about the possible danger. The little girl realized that it seemed that Emperor Cyril was silently destroying monsters, thus showing kindness. Left alone with the girl, the maid confessed that she had not seen the monsters and had no idea of His Majesty's intentions, and as a result had behaved very rudely. And the little girl, who had listened to her, said that she too had behaved badly, but if her father had explained it to her at once, she would not have been afraid of him. Because Emperor Cyril kept quiet, Princess Daya in the original story died without ever learning the truth, because she really didn't know that the cold ice emperor actually loved her very much. The emperor, approaching the chained villain who wanted to eat his daughter, fiercely asked what he should do with him, when suddenly the chief magician intervened in the conversation and said that this man had kidnapped the princess with the help of a black flower but his soul had already been undermined by the monster who had taken over his body. The stranger again asked to be given the daughter of the Ice Emperor, and the head of the empire looked at him contemptuously, called him a chatty bastard, and then grabbed him by the neck, pressing him tightly against the wall to shut him up, looking directly into the stranger's eyes. The father of the kidnapped princess said that he seemed to have entered the castle using some clever trick, and added that he had not invented it, and then asked who had suggested it. Gasping, the wizard admitted that the plan had been devised by Mr. Gargelg, and then began to burn, screaming painfully. The Empire's chief wizard immediately guessed that the rogue had likely been bewitched, so that he would suffer at the pronunciation of the culprit's name. Feeling the black magic power, the Emperor frantically clenched his fists and admitted that he knew that sooner or later, the evil god would start hunting them. Then he ordered to call King Legzarin while leaving the room. A while later, sitting before King Legzarin, the Ice Emperor apologized for such a sudden invitation, and the captain of the knights standing nearby noted that Legzarin was an independent state from the Empire. The king was much older and had ruled longer. 
yet His Majesty looked more imposing than his guest. There was silence, and the king hastened to interrupt it by asking what occasion his acquaintance had called him, to which the latter replied sternly that a stranger in the cloak of the kingdom of Legzerin had entered their castle, summoning a servant who held an article of clothing in his hand. The king turned pale and tried to exclaim, but the emperor continued, explaining that a wizard from the guest's kingdom had invaded the castle and, along with the monsters, had tried to harm his daughter, and asked if he could consider the incident a declaration of war. The king, jumping up from his seat, perplexedly shouted that he had not declared war on anyone, and in general they had never been in collusion with monsters, which did not surprise the interlocutor, who expected such a reaction. So he asked if the indignant could prove his innocence. Shamefully lowering his head, the head of the kingdom of Legzerin admitted that now their country was suffering from the invasion of monsters, so they despised these monsters and would never unite with him. And the emperor, tiredly closing his eyes, realized that, according to his interlocutor, some monster could take possession of the body of his wizard. Bowing to the emperor, the king apologized sincerely for the trouble his country's troubles had brought upon his heiress, and the latter, not believing the speaker, asked if he was related to Gargelg. The interlocutor startled the room and shrieked in surprise, asking how the man knew his name. Now the head of the empire guessed that they were all acquainted and asked to start by telling everything he knew. Some time later, the captain met his colleague, third captain Rogue, who asked how the conversation had gone, to which the latter replied that Legzerin had turned out to be innocent, but they had learned something interesting. Noticing his companion's questioning look, the man told him that they had learned that the evil god Garalg was sealed in Legzerin and had done so 500 years ago. Lately, the monsters had revived, and it seemed to mean that the seal had weakened. We learned that the seal itself was still in effect, but now the god was able to influence the monsters in the area and was hunting Princess Daya, but his majesty pressured the king. So now Legzarin will definitely work on strengthening the seal, which means they should be stronger. Having finished his story, the speaker asked his interlocutor how his son was doing, and the latter told him that the boy, as soon as he returned home, was always practicing with the sword and wanted very much to become a knight quickly, and the captain, hearing this, asked his acquaintance to bring his son to him to train him. Two weeks had passed since the conversation with King Legzerin, and the castle was quiet again. A maid came into the heroine's room and bid her good night, turning off the light and carefully reminding her to use the bell if she needed anything. Before going to sleep, the girl thought about the fact that since the day of their kidnapping, Fay and Ivan had been very busy, and no matter how many times she asked to meet with them, they refused. Turning over on her side, she disappointedly realized that they were both sons of aristocrats, which meant they had a lot to do. But assuming that maybe her friends weren't coming to see her because they were both upset, the little girl went to the window, remembered that Faye was supposed to be at the wizarding dormitory, and thought maybe she should see him, even though she realized that running away a second time would be bad, but she still really wanted to meet her friends. The emperor entered the room and interrupted his daughter's reverie, asking her why she was awake and what she was doing at the window, to which the girl confessed that she had not slept, and her father guessed that she was trying to escape again. The girl, catching her relative's judgmental look, now realized that he would not kill her. But she was still very frightened and hastened to assure him that she did not mean to run away, but was just thinking about how Faye and Ivan were doing. Hearing that his daughter was interested in these guys and noticing that they had become upset lately, the emperor gently took her in his arms, which pleased her very much, and then carelessly threw her on the bed, covered her with a blanket, and stroking her head, promised that she would meet them tomorrow. The girl thanked her father for allowing her to meet her friends tomorrow, and, looking at him again, realized that now she would find it difficult to sleep, as she would be anticipating tomorrow's meeting, and the man, stroking the little girl's head once more, looked at her fondly and left. The next day Thes Emperor brought the protagonist to a place for training knights, where, seeing Ivan, she immediately, in a stupor, guessed that he had become a knight. But the attendant refuted her assumption, explaining that her friend was not a knight yet, but had taken a fancy to Cain, the captain of the knights. 
so he was training him. Apparently, he would join the order in three years at the earliest. Upon noticing the emperor and the heiress, the coach and the boy bowed respectfully, as knights should, and the former asked his majesty worriedly what he was doing here without guards, to which the latter, folding his arms indifferently on his chest, replied that he did not need guards and had come to show Daya how Ivan Rogue was doing. When she approached her friend, the heroine was genuinely glad that he was all right, and the boy, without getting up from his knee, mumbled embarrassedly that they had not seen each other for a long time and apologized for refusing to meet her, explaining that he had been training all this time to protect her in case of anything, which amazed her friend, who looked at him with admiration. The trainer, turning to the boy who had spoken, asked him what kind of liberties he allowed himself in front of the emperor, and suggested that his pupil had fallen in love with the princess, which embarrassed him very much, making him blush and explain that his sister and his friend were the same age, so he perceived her only as a sister and only wanted to protect her. The emperor, recognizing the little one's attitude towards his daughter, questioned him about it, and the latter, only now remembering his presence, turned pale and began to apologize, to which the latter, humming, answered nothing and allowed him to continue training further, but added that Daya missed him and asked him to come and see her sometimes. The boy, surprised by what he heard, turned to the girl and offered her to play together again, and the girl, smiling happily, enthusiastically accepted his offer, saying goodbye to him until next time. After that, the Ice Emperor brought the girl to the wizard's laboratory, where she met her friend Fay and his mother. They froze on the spot in surprise, not expecting the arrival of so significant persons, and immediately fell on their knees in front of the visitors as a sign of greeting and respect. Upon approaching the boy, the protagonist smiled sincerely and said that they hadn't seen each other for a long time. So she was curious how he was doing and came to visit him. Upon hearing this, the young mage thanked her for her work and apologized for refusing to meet her. With a proud hand to his chest, Faye explained his constant refusals to meet with the princess by saying that he had decided to study magic harder to become the best wizard in the empire and protect the country including Lady Daya. The emperor, who had been listening to their conversation, came closer to the child, asked if he really wanted to become the best wizard in the empire, and asked if he thought he could surpass his grandfather and him, to which he replied that he hoped he could one day. Exhaling tiredly, the man asked the young wizard at least once a week to allocate time to meet with Daya, and not to become such a petty person, who was sorry for his friends, these words had a strong effect on the child, so he happily ran up to his friend, agreed with her father, and promised not to refuse the girl anymore. Holding out his hand to Princess Daya, Faye offered her further friendship, and the latter, smiling affectionately, shook his hand as a sign of the pact of friendship and thanked the boy.